One area in the campaign on the Western Front that gets almost no attention nowadays is the British and Canadian push into northwestern Germany in 1945. But it was a campaign which saw very heavy fighting, as the British pushed to capture Germany's U-boat construction facilities and naval bases, and also the big cities such as Hamburg. The main U-boat bases were Kiel and Wilhelmshaven. There were also huge U-boat yards in Hamburg, the region's biggest city, and Cuxhaven was home to the German Navy's minesweeping service. All these locations have been heavily bombed, including the cities of Bremen and Bremerhaven. And most of Germany's large surface warships were, by March 1945, derelict or sunk. And now, a brief pause while we hear from our sponsor. So, why play World of Tanks? As an historian, I appreciate the accuracy and attention to detail of the vehicles, and the excellent game mechanics to heighten realism and immersion. For example, camouflage, shell ricochets, and module and personnel damage. World of Tanks combines aspects of great RPG games and first-person shooters. Experience intense tank-on-tank -tank combat in a unique battlefield that's a mix of multiple genres. Fight using tanks from all your favorite historical time periods from the earliest to the present day. Register into the game now through the link in the description. Remember, World of Tanks is a free-to-play game. Choose the invite code COMBAT and new players will receive a Cromwell B British Premium Medium Tank, 250,000 credits and 7 days premium access. There are also three rental tanks for 10 battles each. Tiger 131 German Heavy Tank, T-78 American Tank Destroyer and Type 64 Chinese Premium Light Tank. Go to the link in the description and start battling today. Flensburg remained operational as a U-boat base, as did several of the others, and U-boats continued to operate all over the world until the German surrender. The big production yards continued to build Hitler's sea wolves until virtually the end, including quantities of the revolutionary new Type 21 and 23 electro boats, which could have posed a serious threat to the Allies if sufficient numbers had entered combat some time before the end of the war. However, the destruction wrought by Allied bombing and supply problems meant that both the brand new Electro boats and more traditional U-boats under repair were often wrecked before they could be sent out to sea. This, coupled with the degrading of Germany's surface warship fleet, left thousands of sailors effectively unemployed. A process had begun some time earlier of rerouting surplus sailors, along with excess Luftwaffe personnel into German Army and Waffen-SS divisions, to keep up the manpower strength on the three fronts that Germany was engaged upon. In particular, the late-war Volksgrenadier divisions that had been such a feature of the December 1944 to January 1945 Battle of the Bulge contained huge numbers of such personnel, in addition to civilians combed out of industry. The high command of the Navy was not happy about this arrangement, and took steps to win Hitler's approval for it to form naval infantry divisions that would remain obviously under naval command. The first such unit, the 10,000-strong 1st Naval Infantry Division, was founded in February 1945 at Flensburg and sent to the Eastern Front. However, most of the Navy's unemployed U-boat men, crews who were often highly decorated veterans of the Battle of the Atlantic and elsewhere, were formed into a second naval division created in Schleswig-Holstein in March 1945. Highly decorated U-boat commanders were placed in charge of its regiments. Although all sailors had of course undergone weapons familiarization and also a brief period of infantry training prior to their initial naval training, these men were not marines, but simply submariners who were forced to become infantrymen. Not very hot on tactics, they would be noted, however, for their bravery, tenacity and stubbornness, and highly rated by the British forces that fought against them. The 2nd Naval Infantry Division was given the task of slowing down the British-Canadian advance on Germany's remaining naval bases in the West. Why? Well, although the U-boats were by now struggling to operate effectively from German ports, with many of the operations being transferred to Norway, 
Grand Admiral Carl Dernitz, head of the Kriegsmarine, had enacted a huge maritime evacuation effort, codenamed Operation Hannibal, from Soviet-besieged Kurland, East Prussia, West Prussia and Pomerania. This operation had begun in January 1945 and would last just after the German surrender. Using all available Kriegsmarine surface ships and merchant vessels, convoys of German troops and civilians were progressively evacuated to Germany and Denmark, running a gauntlet of Soviet submarines and aircraft, thus escaping Soviet captivity and the brutal reprisals the Red Army was making, particularly against civilians. Dönitz made Hannibal his priority and ordered that the Western Allies had to be denied the North German ports as long as possible. Therefore, the bulk of the U-boat men would now be used to try and hold the line against the British to buy time for Hannibal to continue and hopefully to complete the evacuations from the east. Kämpfen heißt opfern und siegen. Der Kampf geht weiter. The 2nd Naval Infantry Division amounted to some 7,500 men, with moderate artillery support and some tank destroyers attached, dug in along the Weser and Leiner rivers, and also around the town of Rettem on the river Aller between Bremen and Hanover in early April 1945. Their positions were assaulted by the British 11th Armoured Division and the 53rd Welsh Infantry Division, and the fighting was very heavy. The German sailors, however, managed to completely halt the British at several points, dramatically slowing the British advance on these river lines, and inflicting significant casualties as well. It proved to be an unequal fight, and in the face of massive Allied air superiority and huge artillery attacks, the 2nd Naval Division's regiments eventually gave way. So impressed were the British with the fanatical fighting abilities of the U-boat men that they nicknamed them the Blue SS, comparing them favourably with that other fanatical group of German soldiers, Himmler's Waffen-SS. Most importantly to Dönitz, the great port city of Hamburg had to be held for as long as possible. If Hamburg fell, the whole of Schleswig-Holstein would fold, from where shipping was conducting evacuation operations from the Kurland pocket and elsewhere in the east. Hamburg contained a very mixed local garrison, some Volkssturm home guard units, some Hitler youth, a single army garrison infantry regiment, large-scale Luftwaffe flak batteries, and some shattered Waffen-SS units, the most complete being the 12th SS Training and Replacement Battalion from the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend. The battle commandant was Luftwaffe Generalmajor Alvin Volz, commanding the 3rd Flak Division. There were also a number of small tank hunting units formed from U boat men, the major one being the 1st Naval Anti Tank Regiment formed out of U-boat men that had been waiting to crew the new electro-boats and other more traditional U-boats under repair. Commanding the regiment was U-boat ace Kapitän Zerze Robert Geyser. He had sunk 25 Allied ships over eight U-boat patrols and was a holder of the Knight's Cross with oak leaves and the U-boat badge with diamonds. Taken from his post as commander of the 25th U-Boat Flotilla, a training unit at Gutenhafen, Geyser took command of the new anti-tank unit. The 1st Naval Anti-Tank Regiment had a small staff and three infantry battalions, each consisting of three companies. In total, the regiment numbered some 1,700 U-boatmen. Its troops were armed with infantry weapons, and its main anti-tank weapon was the Panzerfaust, a handheld grenade launcher that fired an 88mm anti-tank shaped charge warhead that was lethal to most Allied tanks. The weapon wasn't a rocket, as some people think, rather the warhead was propelled by a black powder charge, the hollow tube acting as an exhaust, making the Panzerfaust a recoilless weapon. The warhead was fired at an angle, with an effective range of 60 metres or 200 feet. It had much more destructive power than the US Bazooka or the German Panzerschreck rocket, 
but required the operator to either ambush enemy armor or close on foot to within a few dozen yards to ensure effective use of the weapon. In the hands of brave and determined soldiers, the Panzerfaust was very effective, and all across the eastern and western fronts, the Allies constantly encountered these cheap throwaway weapons, which were rightly feared. The new regiment's second battalion would prove its worth during the fight for Hamburg, under the command of Corvetten Kapitän Peter Erich Kramer. Another distinguished U-boat skipper, he had received the Knight's Cross and was commanding one of Germany's new Type 21 electroboats, U-2519, when he was sent to take command of the 2nd Battalion of the Tank Destroyer Regiment. Other highly decorated U-boat officers were also involved with tank hunting units from the Battle for Hamburg, including Kapitän Leutnant Götz von Hartmann and Corvetten Kapitän Karl Emmermann the latter formerly commanding the 31st U-boat flotilla in Hamburg. During the course of his career, Emmermann had sunk 27 Allied warships and also received the Knight's Cross. The British operation to capture Hamburg was led by the famed 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats. On the 18th of April 1945, the 1st Royal Tank Regiment captured Vela, while the 8th King's Royal Irish Hussars and the 1st 5th Queen's Regiment moved up to bypass the Langelor Forest, which was full of Panzerfaust teams from the 1st Naval Anti-Tank Regiment, driving five miles to capture Tostedt. On the 19th of April, the Queen's and the 8th Hussars captured Hollenstedt, and the British armour tangled with 88mm flak guns used in the ground roll, knocking out eight, but also sustaining many casualties themselves. On the 20th of April, Hitler's 56th birthday, the 8th Hussars and A Company 1st Battalion the Rifle Brigade took Deersdorf, eight miles west of Harburg, a town lying to the south of the city of Hamburg, and in fact a suburb of the city. Deersdorf witnessed intense hand-to-hand -hand fighting to clear the town. British artillery now began shelling German troops and trains on the other side of the Elbe River. Meanwhile, the British 131st Infantry Brigade captured Warensdorf, two miles south of Harburg. Then the British halted and began preparations for its main assault on the huge urban sprawl of Hamburg. The Germans, however, took this opportunity to counterattack. From the previous few days, Kramer's 2nd Battalion of the Naval Anti-Tank Regiment had proved its worth, destroying and damaging British tanks. Lacking sufficient motorised transport, Kramer's three companies were either on foot or more usually on specially adapted military bicycles, each seaman able to carry two Panzerfausts on a rack in the front of the handlebars. Using the techniques of ambush, Kramer's unit succeeded, according to German records, in knocking out 24 British tanks as reported in the Wehrmacht official communique of the 25th of April 1945. The German counterattack was launched at 2.30am on the 26th of April, with the 12th SS Reinforcement and Training Regiment supported by some of Geyser's U-boat tank hunting units, some Hitler Youth and police supported by 88mm guns, and also a couple of tank destroyers. It was directed against Warensdorf. The tank destroyers advanced into the centre of the village with infantry support, the battle raging all day. British tanks came up and managed to knock out the German assault guns, and on the 27th of April the Germans withdrew, having suffered 60 killed and 70 taken prisoner. The British now assaulted Harburg, using the 5th Royal Tank Regiment, the 9th Battalion Durham Light Infantry and I Company 1st Battalion the Rifle Brigade. The Germans continued with a stubborn defence, well supported by re-rolled 88mm flak guns. The British had also bypassed over the previous few days many German units in the woods south of Harburg, including U-boat tank hunting parties, and these were progressively eliminated or captured, 2,000 Germans being made prisoners of war. 
On the 28th of April 1945, the 3rd Regiment, Royal Horse Artillery, began shelling the Phoenix rubber works in Hamburg itself, and the Germans sensed now that the battle was effectively over. There did not appear to have been any stomach for a house-by-house, street-by-street battle in the city of Hamburg itself, which had suffered so much from Allied bombing, particularly its civilian population. A delegation came into British lines under a flag of truce on the 29th of April to discuss surrender terms. With the death of Hitler in Berlin on the 30th of April, Dönitz, commanding all German forces in northwestern Europe, and now Reich president as well, ordered Generalmajor Wolz to open discussions with the British command. On the 2nd of May, talks were held, and the next day, 3rd of May, Hamburg was formally surrendered to the British. The 11th Hussars of the 7th Armoured Division drove into the wrecked city that afternoon. However, a lot of German troops had retreated north into the Jutland Peninsula and also into Kiel, joining up with German forces retreating from the Red Army in the east. The 7th Armoured Division advanced quickly to Lübeck, but on the 4th of May, the German armies in northern Europe surrendered to Field Marshal Montgomery at Lüneburg Heath. However, it was not the end of the story for part of the 1st Naval Anti-Tank Regiment. The 2nd Battalion, down to only 16 men under Peter Eric Kramer, was ordered to Grand Admiral Dönitz's headquarters to become his personal bodyguard unit. Due to Winston Churchill allowing Dönitz and his rump Nazi government to continue to exist after the complete German surrender on the 9th of May 1945, I made a video about this link in the end screen. Kramer's men remained under arms until the British dissolved the Dönitz government by force on the 23rd of May, and Kramer and his men became prisoners of war. Although not too much information survives concerning how effective Captain Geyser's anti-tank regiment of U-boat men was in the Battle of Hamburg, the British noted several times the fanatical resistance and bravery of these and other German sailors in both the defence and in the attack and their Panzerfaust certainly knocked out or damaged quite a number of British armoured vehicles in their last battle in northern Germany. The commanding officer of the 1st Naval Anti-Tank Regiment, Robert Geyser, went back to sea post-war in occupied Germany's first post-war naval force, the German Minesweeping Administration. In 1956, he joined the new Bundesmarine and was German naval attaché in the U.S. for four years, and later commanded the North Sea Division of the West German Navy, retiring in 1970 with the rank of Flottillenadmiral, or Commodore, in U.S. and Royal Navy rank systems. Geyser died in 1989 at the age of 78. Peter Eric Kramer became a businessman post-war and died in Hamburg in 1992 at the age of 81. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.